Hello everyone and welcome back to Intuitive Epidemiology. In part one of this video, we will discuss confounding bias and randomization. My name is Taylor McClendon and I am an epidemiologist and I also work as an HIV researcher in Vancouver. As discussed in previous videos, epidemiology is the study of what affects the health of people. Broadly speaking, epidemiology can be broken down into three broad analytical approaches, description, prediction, and explanation. Explanation, the focus of this video, relates to the examination of relationships or associations between exposures and outcomes. If you are able to estimate a causal effect from our epidemiological study, which is an effect estimated in the absence of bias, we are able to say that the exposure does in fact cause, or in some cases prevent, the outcome. Bias is any systematic error that results in a non-causal estimate from our study. Therefore, causal inference is the process of producing unbiased research findings. In epidemiology, randomization, or more specifically, randomization of the exposure or treatment that people receive is a powerful tool in our mission of estimating causal effects, or our mission of producing unbiased scientific research findings that can be used to inform good decision making. In this video, we will follow through this hypothetical example. We will examine the relationship between a treatment and a clinical outcome. For example, does treatment A versus treatment B reduce disease? Specifically, is HIV treatment A better than treatment B in terms of preventing AIDS-defining illnesses. Our hypothetical finding will be a statistical estimate quantifying the relationship between treatment A versus B and its impact on disease. And our estimate will be what is known as an odds ratio alongside its 95% confidence interval. An odds ratio, or an OR, is the odds of someone experiencing the disease given they were exposed divided by the odds of somebody experiencing the disease given they were unexposed. In other words, it's the odds of the disease in those who receive the treatment divided by the odds of experiencing the disease in those who do not receive the treatment. An odds ratio equal to one indicates that the exposure has no impact on the likelihood of the outcome occurring. In other words, it's the, it tells you that the treatment has no impact on the occurrence of the disease, for better or worse. If the odds ratio is greater than one, it indicates that the exposure increases the likelihood of the outcome, or that it increases the occurrence of the outcome. If the odds ratio is less than one, it indicates that the exposure decreases the likelihood of the outcome occurring. Now this is a hypothetical finding that you may find in the abstract of a scientific paper. The odds of experiencing disease were 0.8 times lower for those who received treatment A as compared to treatment B and you will see an odds ratio of 0.8 alongside a 95% confidence interval, which is a measure of precision around that point estimate of 0.8. And you might also read that this result was statistically significant. While I will discuss the meaning of adjusted and statistically significant in a later video, I wanted to emphasize that the amount of bias in your study dictates how useful this study is, or this finding is, for decision making. 
In other words, does the odds ratio of 0.8 reflect any meaningful truth? If our finding is unbiased, then we've estimated the causal effect of the treatment on the outcome. In this case, we could say that treatment A versus B, in fact, does prevent disease. If we were able to estimate a, quote, minimally biased finding, then we have what is what could be referred to as a reliable association, in that treatment A versus B may prevent disease. In a strongly biased setting, we then have an unreliable association, where we really do not know what is going on with respect to treatment A and B and their effect on disease. Specifically, in the case where we can estimate an unbiased finding or a causal effect, we can say the following. While the mechanism is unclear, for some people, under certain circumstances, treatment A is indeed better than treatment B in terms of preventing disease. In other words, when considered alongside all other relevant research and patient information, this example, made up study, provides useful information that will inform clinical decision making. Give treatment A instead of treatment B. Now I wanted to emphasize that while this example uses treatment A versus treatment B, all of these ideas and principles apply to exposures A versus B more generally. As discussed in past videos, an exposure can be a treatment, an intervention, a broad range of determinants, it's sometimes referred to as a correlate, and it can also be a risk factor or a protective factor. We talked about participants receiving treatment A versus treatment B for HIV. We could refer to interventions, A versus B, and we can also refer to a broad range of determinants, such as behaviors, comparing tobacco smokers to non-smokers. We could compare genders and ethnicities with respect to certain outcomes. But more broadly, we can compare any two groups defined by a specific characteristic. Now, while I won't spend much time on this slide, I wanted to introduce you to study designs in epidemiology. Up at the top, we have experimental studies, primarily focused on randomized controlled trials, or RCTs. In experimental studies, the researcher assigns treatment. The researcher decides who gets treatment A versus who gets treatment B. Therefore, they're controlled because their researcher dictates the circumstances surrounding treatment or surrounding exposure status. Who gets A versus who gets B, when and for how long. At the bottom, we have observational studies where the researcher observes whether treatment A or B is already being taken in quote unquote, the real world. In terms of observational studies, we have cohort studies, case control studies, and cross-sectional studies. These studies are uncontrolled because the patient and the clinician have already decided who, when, and for how long with respect to the exposure, which in this case is a hypothetical treatment for a disease. So which study design do you choose? This can be broken down into a bias versus feasibility trade-off. And these trade-offs are reflected in a hierarchy of evidence, which I will show you on the next slide. Bias refers to any systematic error in a study that results in a non-causal estimate. And as you can recall, an estimate can be an odds ratio and a 95% confidence interval. 
Feasibility refers to whether a study is likely to be delivered successfully, taking into account the practical aspects of implementing and managing the project. Now, our ability to reduce bias by choosing a better study design is often limited by resources, whether they be financial or otherwise, as well as ethical concerns. And ethical concerns are often brought up in the context of experimental studies or more specifically, randomized controlled trials. Now this is the hierarchy of evidence or the evidence pyramid where the study designs at the top have a greater potential of being better or less biased. As you can see in this figure, experimental studies or randomized controlled trials are up at the top. In this case, RCTs or randomized trials have the potential of being minimally biased, but they also have the potential of being unethical or very high cost. In terms of observational studies, the bias may increase as you go down the pyramid, but the feasibility or the practicality of doing those studies becomes better. Now to recap, the goal of an epidemiologist is to produce unbiased research findings to inform good decision making, whether that be by physicians, by policymakers, or by governments. In this hypothetical example, we're talking about examining a relationship between a treatment and a clinical outcome. For example, does HIV treatment A versus treatment B reduce AIDS defining illnesses? Our finding was a hypothetical statistical estimate quantifying the relationship between treatment A versus treatment B and disease. And this estimate could be an odds ratio and a 95% confidence interval. And we can estimate this number either using an experimental study design, such as a randomized controlled trial, or an observational study design, such as a cohort study, a case control study, or a cross-sectional study. In experimental studies, the researcher is in control. And because they're in control, they can reduce bias, but this often comes at an increased cost. Specifically, in this setting, the researcher dictates the circumstances surrounding the exposure. For example, the researcher can randomly assign treatment A or treatment B. However, the feasibility of randomized trials or experimental studies is often limited by resources and potentially by ethical concerns. In terms of observational studies, a lack of influence or a lack of control can lead to increased bias, but it often means that observational studies can be done at a reduced cost. They are uncontrolled because the patient and or the clinician has already dictated the circumstances surrounding the exposure. And the researcher simply observes whether treatment A or B are already being taken in the real world. However, in observational studies, bias or threats to validity are often pervasive for many reasons. And as you can guess from the title of this video, confounding bias is a major concern in epidemiology, particularly when doing observational epidemiologic research. Confounding refers to differences in the exposed and the unexposed group, or differences in the treated and the untreated group beyond the exposure or the treatment itself. A confounder or a confounding variable is a factor which represents differences between groups A and B, exposed, unexposed, treated, or untreated. And this confounding factor must be associated with both the occurrence of the outcome, 
as well as the occurrence of the exposure. Therefore, if you're looking to examine the relationship between a treatment and a given disease, you must consider confounding factors or variables that can bias this relationship of interest. Unpacking confounding with various examples is the topic of part two of this video. Therefore, I encourage you to watch this second video to better understand how we address confounding bias, this major threat to validity in both experimental studies as well as observational studies. With that, thank you for watching. Please subscribe to this channel if you're interested in this content. And if I've missed anything, feel free to ask questions and leave comments below. You can click on the left-hand side to watch the second video directly.